Um, so, uh, like I said, as far as the book is concerned, how it's presenting this information, um, we just went through the basically first module of the chapter here, which is about the lymphatic structures. Um, and then it goes on, the rest of the chapter is about immune function. Um, I can wait. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the rest of the chapter is really about immune function. Um, and before we actually get into the specifics about that, uh, I want to spend some time talking about immune function in a little broader sense and to introduce you to some ideas about it. Um, <clears throat> And I'm going to use this presentation software for this. Um, I don't tend to use this presentation software too often for a couple of reasons. The major one being that um, I haven't updated these presentations too much with pictures from the current textbook because I usually just pull the textbook up and go through the pictures there. But um, <clears throat> what I want to cover for the rest of tonight, it's really just everything uh, doesn't get out of this little block of the presentation. There is one picture here from a textbook, um, but I kind of like the way that it organizes the information, so I'll use that. But then the rest of it is uh, <clears throat> sort of taking a little bit of my own approach to setting up talking about immune function. So the first thing I want to mention is about immune function um, <clears throat> gets at the problem that most every textbook sets up here, which I'm not crazy about. Um, I am certainly not an expert on immunity or the immune function, immune system, or anything like that, so I'm not qualified to write a chapter like this. Um, and so there's just so much whining I'm allowed to do in the case. But um, I used to use a textbook, our department here used to use a textbook, that had two chapters, one on the lymphatic system and one on the immune system. And I thought that was much better than pretty much every other book that we've used and that I've come across that puts them together because the lymphatic system and the immune system are not exactly one and the same. Now the lymphatic system is an organ system and we just talked about it. It's made up of lymphatic vessels and lymph nodes and tonsils and um, spleen and thymus and all that stuff that we just covered. But its function is really primarily circulatory. It's returning fluid from the tissues that's been lost at capillary, blood capillary beds and returning that back to the cardiovascular system. Because it does that, it's optimal for these other functions. One of them is really a digestive function, and the other one is the immune function. <clears throat> so the lymphatic system is more than immunity. And then also the immune system is an immune function is more than lymphatics, which is to say they're not the same kind of system. One is an organ system, the other one's a functional system. Um, <clears throat> there are components of the immune system and immune responses that are throughout all of the different organ systems in our body. All of the anatomy in our body can play a part to some degree in immune function. So we're going to concentrate quite a bit on white blood cells, not just lymphocytes, a few other white blood cells also. Um, so obviously, a bl blood is a component of immune function. Now, those cells are often not in the cardiovascular uh, circulation when they're doing their job, but there are things in the blood that are part of it. There's uh, antibodies and other proteins and chemicals that play a part in immune function that are in the blood itself. And the blood is not the lymphatic system. Um, and then, since we're talking about the blood, obviously it's moving through the cardiovascular uh, system, specifically the blood vessels, so it's got to transport through that. And then we just looked at the lymphatic system, and as the fluid that's lost from cardiovascular circulation is reclaimed through that, a lot of that stuff's going to happen there. Um, I suppose in this list I probably should have interstitial fluid right after the lymphatic organs. Um, because it kind of fits in with how I was talking about that stuff. But I put it at the end because interstitial fluid is basically everywhere. 
every tissue has an interstitial fluid to it. Um, so that's kind of the broadest aspect of this. That really ties all of the different tissues in there. Between lymphatic organs and interstitial fluid, I have listed there dendritic cells. And dendritic cells are found in the skin and four other important places. Um, I have a skin mentioned here specifically and all the rest is encapsulated, etc. Because we talked about it in the skin already. We talked about the skin. Uh, back in AMP1 talking about the skin. In the uh, stratum spinosum, there's a specific cell there, which for the skin is sometimes referred to as a cell of Langerhans or a Langerhans cell. That's just the specific dead white guy name for dendritic cell in the skin. Dendritic cells are sort of the lookouts for the immune system. If a pathogen, a virus or a bacterium or whatever, gets through the defensive barrier of your skin, dendritic cells are there to notice that breach and alert the rest of the immune system to that so that you can respond to it. Now the etc. there is talking about the four mucous membranes. So the respiratory mucous membrane, the digestive mucous membrane, the reproductive mucous membrane, and the urinary mucous membrane. They all also have dendritic cells in them. We don't call them cells of Langerhans because that dead white guy name is specific to those cells in the skin, but as a group they are dendritic cells. Um, and they spend their time primarily in those organs until they're called upon to respond to an infection. And they move out of those organs and into the lymphatic system and off uh, to help initiate a, an immune response to that. Okay. So all of that's to say that there's a lot of different structures that are part of the immune system's uh, function. And it goes well beyond the lymphatic system. Okay. So <clears throat> part of what I'm doing here is to sort of draw a line in the sand between the lymphatic system and the immune system within this chapter, because it's important to understand that they're not exactly one and the same. Okay. Um, <clears throat> also, as I'm talking about this, as I'm introducing this, when we're talking about the immune function, Necessarily, we're going to break it down into uh, components. It's just easier to talk about it that way. Um, but you have to understand that it is an integrated whole. Your immune response is a series of things that happen when something gets into your body or when tissues damage somewhere in your body. Exactly what happened varies from situation to situation depending on what players are involved, whether it's bacteria or virus or fungus or parasitic worm or whatever, and in how well you respond to or how well the immune response does its job. Um, <clears throat> the first players in any re immune response might do the job and the immune response ends and the other players are never called upon because they're never needed. As we talk about the components, we're going to talk about some of those early players first, and we're going to talk about some of those later components uh, at the end of the system, as if they're two separate things. But they're really just different um, components to an integrated uh, immune response. Okay. And so we don't want to forget that the whole system really does work together. And when we get to the end of things next week, um, there's a summary figure that kind of ties it all back together. We can see how these components interplay. Now, um, this picture, like I said, is from another textbook. Um, but I like the way that it kind of sets this up. Uh, so these components that, we're, that we want to talk about are innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Innate means what you're born with. So in the little box there, which you might not be able to read from where you're sitting, it just says genetically determined. I'm not crazy about that, that uh, phrase, but it's fair, I suppose. Um, it's what you're born with. So some of it is passive protection, like your skin. Now your skin is genetically determined because there are genes that turn on and cause tissue to become skin in your body. And so it's fair to say that, but um, <clears throat> there are genetically determined components of adaptive immunity too. So it's not a great term there. It's really more what's present at the time of birth. 
Um, the thing is, is that at the time of birth, you're only able to respond to general threats. Okay? After you're born, your immune system has to adapt to your particular environment. And so innate immunity, which is represented here by a very small box, is one component that we're going to start by talking about next week. And then we're going to go on to talk about adaptive immunity, which is a bigger box here, kind of because it's a bigger thing. It's going to take a little bit more work to understand. Um, but it's really kind of what drives a lot of the immune system's function. Okay? Now, the reason why the box is bigger here is because there's nothing inside innate immunity, but there's a lot of stuff inside of adaptive immunity. So since it's here, I just want to talk about a few of these things just to set up stuff that we're going to get to next week. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the two big boxes within adaptive immunity here say active immunity and passive immunity. <clears throat> we could talk about the innate system, and there's an active and a passive component to that. Your skin is a passive component of innate immunity. It doesn't exactly have to do anything specifically to fight off infections. It's there. And it's day-to-day -day business helps to protect us from infection, along with a lot of other things. And then there are active components of innate immunity, some cells that go out and do something uh, when they're called upon. So we could put two boxes within innate immunity also that say active and passive. So active and passive don't mean something specific for adaptive immunity, but what it's getting at here is for adaptive immunity, it's <clears throat> when the adaptive immune response is energetically responding to something versus when uh, <clears throat> the energy, if you will, for the response comes from outside of us. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we get into this. Now, we'll talk more about what adaptive immunity is uh, in depth next week, but simply put, it's about antibodies. Antibodies and related molecules that I'll explain more next week are adapting to specific things that can cause problems in our body, whether it's a foreign um, pathogen or something that's gone wrong inside our body like cancer or uh, some sort of degenerative disease or something like that. Uh, for what we know at this point, antibodies kind of sums up a lot of what that's about. There's more to it, and we'll talk about that next week. But for what I want to say here, we'll just concentrate on antibodies as an example here. So passive immunity is when the antibodies are from somewhere else. You're not making those antibodies. And active immunity is when you are making those antibodies. They come from you. And then within each of those, there's a naturally acquired and an artificially induced component of the immunity. Um, so let me talk about passive immunity first, because as the story goes, it's where we sort of start. When you're born, you do not have an active adaptive immunity. You're not ready to fight off things in your environment that can make you sick. So you acquire that immunity naturally from your mother. In the um, relationship between the placenta and the maternal um, cardiovascular system, there's an exchange of antibodies that the mother makes into the fetus. Blood. And then when that fetus is born, uh, those antibodies are present to <coughs> passively uh, be the immunity for that newborn against things that the mother's already immune to. If the mother develops an immunity to something after the child's born, but before the child's immune system is ready to be active on its own, any additional immunity can be transferred through the mother's milk. Okay. So it says there are antibodies across the placenta of breast milk. Um, <clears throat> the breast milk component is probably actually fairly minor. Um, from what I understand, what would have to happen is after a woman gives birth and she's passed on all the antibodies from her own immunity to the newborn, if she's then exposed to something that she wasn't immune to before and her immune system then uh, adapts to that, so she develops an immunity to that new pathogen, she can transfer that immunity through the breast milk. It's probably unlikely that that's going to happen very often, but 
it is a component there. And I say that it's probably unlikely that that's hap gonna happen very often because um, not every newborn can get breast milk. Okay? Whether it's uh, by choice of the mother or because of some condition of the mother, breast milk is not 100% required for the success of a baby. Artificially induced passive immunity is when the antibodies come from somewhere else, but it's given to you in an artificial way. Now, I'm not really crazy about the use of the word natural, because it's a very vague term, but what it means is the naturally acquired immunity is what's built into the system. Everybody gets it from their mother. Artificially induced is something that has to be given, and it's likely going to be given hypodermically through a needle therapeutically. The best example of that is a snake bite kit. If you're bit by a snake, whether you're a newborn or an adult, you're not going to be able to develop your own immunity to that in time to save your life. Uh, snake bite venom is very active neurotoxin and will cause death very quick, fairly quickly. So in a snake bite kit, there's going to be a little ampule of anti-snake venom uh, serum anti-snake toxin serum, and that can be injected, and suddenly you have antibodies against that toxic molecule, and your immune system can get rid of it. Without that, it would cause toxicity, and you'd die. But you can artificially induce that immunity in that sort of sense. There are other therapies that are similar. Uh, I can't think of all the different reasons. I suppose if somebody's immunocompromised, if they have some sort of um, immunodeficiency disease, whether that's AIDS or something else, um, they can get passive immunity through some sort of treatment uh, in a similar way. But the snake bite uh, kit is a good example of that. On the active side, um, the natural and um, artificially induced thing, again, isn't a great distinction, but it's usually pretty obvious where what we mean by that. In both cases, it's where your system... Um, learns about a pathogen and develops antibodies to um, help fight off that pathogen in the future. Naturally acquired is when you're exposed to something and it makes you sick. Let's, I like to use the example of chickenpox. Okay? So you're exposed to chickenpox, you get the chickenpox virus in your system, it makes you sick, you have chickenpox, you're not allowed to scratch it, whatever, um, but you fight it off and the pox go away after a couple weeks or something like that. Um, and then after that, you're not going to get chicken pox again because you have developed your own immunity to that. That's a naturally acquired active immunity. That happens all the time. You're exposed to all sorts of things. You know, <clears throat> the person sitting next to you coughs on you, and you're exposed to some new variant of an influenza virus. Okay. And when, if that doesn't make you sick, uh, you might already be immune to it. If it makes you sick and you get over it, then you have um, acquired an immunity to that. Happens all the time. Artificially induced active immunity is vaccination. So it's artificial in the sense that you're given whatever the pathogen is on purpose. Now, the pathogen that's used in uh, a, um, a vaccine is not a functional pathogen. It's not going to actually make you sick. But it will activate your adaptive immunity to the point where you'll develop an immunity to that. Now, I use the chicken pox for a reason because I've never had chicken pox, but I'm immune to it. Um, <clears throat> I hope that this is true, but I don't actually know for you. But in college, and we'll assume that it's true for this college, when you apply to the college, you have to share information about your immunizations with student health. Okay. I really hope this school does that. Um, when I went to college, I had to do that when I started out, and um, I think I had to go in and get a blood test to, to check my titer levels against various things that I didn't have any evidence of uh, immunity to, such as chickenpox. I never had chickenpox as a kid, so there's no reason for me to, to expect I was immune to it. And so uh, at that time when I was uh, starting college is about when the chickenpox vaccine came out. So I was given... Uh, the chickenpox vaccine at that point. I've never had chickenpox, I'm now immune to it, and I will never have chickenpox again uh, in the future. Very happy that that's true because my brother, who's a little older than me, about the same time, actually a couple years earlier, got chickenpox. Okay? So 
uh, this would be when I was starting college, so it was about when he was finishing college, he got chicken pox. Chicken pox as an adult is a horrible, horrible thing, apparently. I've read. So, um, I'm surprised, one, that I never had chicken pox and that my brothers never had chicken pox either because my dad's doctor and my mother works in the healthcare field too. They both understand artificially induced uh, immunity and naturally acquired immunity. Okay, they understand what vaccines are and they understand how it's really just uh, the natural system reacting to an artificial exposure. And when we were kids, there was no vaccine for chickenpox. Why the heck didn't they take us over to some kids that had chickenpox and got us sick as kids where it's easier to recover from chickenpox and therefore we'd be um, immune to it as we got older. I lucked out because I was uh, at the right age and I got the uh, vaccine. My brother didn't luck, at, luck out because he got it and he was adult. It was a really unpleasant experience for him. It lasted like three or four weeks. Also, um, I'm never going to get shingles. He might get shingles. Um, now, I like to talk about the chickenpox vaccine because of shingles. You've probably heard of the chickenpox vaccine. It's usually advertised as the shingles vaccine. If you're driving down the road and you see at Walgreens or uh, CVS that they're advertising that you can get a shingles vaccine, and probably nobody in here really cares about that right now, but older people, you know, grandmother's age, might say, oh, I probably want to stop in and get a shingles vaccine. The first thing they're going to ask when you ask to get a shingles vaccine is if you've ever had chickenpox. Because there's no point in getting a shingles vaccine if you've had chickenpox, because you're already vaccinated against chickenpox through the naturally acquired immunity. The shingles vaccine is really just the artificially induced immunity to the chickenpox vaccine. What happened when you had chickenpox is that you actually didn't completely get rid of it. A little bit of it hung out in a little corner of your body. And that corner is most likely a dorsal root ganglia. Remember, dorsal root ganglia are the um, nervous tissue that's sticking off at a, um, what do you call this? A spinal nerve. Okay. So there's uh, viruses hanging out there. Later in life, if something happens and there's some sort of stressor in your life, which might be some other um, illness or anxiety or whatever kind of stress. Something can sort of activate those things and they'll be they'll move out from the dorsal root ganglion along the spinal nerve that comes from that ganglion and move out to the skin. And uh, they'll create sort of like pox at that part of the skin that that um, nerve serves. Um, I have two examples of shingles to kind of illustrate this idea. Um, neither of them actually have to do with dorsal root ganglia. It doesn't have to be dorsal root ganglia. It could be any ganglia, but it's going to be some uh, peripheral nervous tissue. Uh, the first one is um, <clears throat> my wife's grandmother. Uh, she had shingles right along her hairline, which would mean that it's uh, the virus was hanging out in the trigeminal ganglia and was moving along the ophthalmic branch uh, to get to the skin, because that's the nerve that serves that part of the skin. Um, it was terribly unfortunate for her because uh, what really irritates shingles is the hairline right there as the hair is touching the skin. It just made her uncomfortable for her. And I use her as an example all the time. And I really, uh, as I think about it, I'm like, oh, I just feel so bad for Nana. But um, it actually occurred because uh, I'm sad to say that she got cancer. And so with the cancer, uh, and I guess the treatments that went with it, it's, it stimulated the um, dorsal root ganglion, I mean, sorry, it stimulated the virus to uh, express as uh, shingles at that point. The other example is probably, I mean, Nana's story is very sad, and I cried at the funeral and all that, but um, the other story is just probably the worst experience I can imagine with shingles. My next door neighbor, one day, I was doing yard work, and he was doing yard work, and we saw each other. It was the first time I'd seen him in probably about a month. He was a lot thinner than he used to be. And so I said, hey, Bob, you look great. You lost a lot of weight. And he goes, yeah, I've stopped eating. And I went, all right, why? He's like, well, I got shingles in my throat. So Nana had shingles in the trigeminal ganglion, which went to her forehead region. Bob has it 
in, I don't know exactly which one, which ganglion, but probably uh, the one associated with the hypoglossal nerve. And so that goes to the soft tissue in his throat, and he got shingles in his throat. So it was so irritating, you couldn't actually swallow food. And so he lost a lot of weight because of it. Um, I don't remember anymore, it was several years ago, I don't remember exactly how they uh, <clears throat> were able to get him nutrition. Uh, they either intubated him or they went with a gastric tube, neither of which is pleasant. But uh, again, after about three or four weeks, uh, things turned around and he got better. But uh, for a little while there, he had you know a very svelte, sleek physique there. Um, he's put it back on since then. But anyways, uh, so that's artificially induced active immunity. Now we'll talk about the immune response and how antibodies are developed, the natural and artificial aspect of, uh, active, of adaptive immunity in more depth. But I just wanted to illustrate that here, um, sort of set up some of the next week. We're going to start next week talking about innate immunity, and then we're going to move on to adaptive immunity. Um, it's probably not fair to try to cram all that into one night, but that's the way it's got to work. We don't have time to continue on with that uh, into the following week. But um, <clears throat> the first half will be mostly about innate immunity, and I'll start a little bit of the adaptive immunity before break, and then the rest of it will be about adaptive immunity. Okay. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about today um, <clears throat> is sort of getting to understand what we're, what our immune system is there for. Um, as I talk about the immune system, I'll often use military or police type metaphors. We have foreign invaders, we're fighting off the pathogens, um, we have sentries in the dendritic cells I mentioned earlier, or we have to alert forces elsewhere in our body to mobilize against the invasion, those sorts of things. Okay. But those are just metaphors. And really what we're talking about is how we deal with these things called pathogens. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the term pathogen. Pathos, from the Greek, means disease or suffering. And then gen is the root in Greek, which gives us a word, words that mean to be born, like generate and uh, genesis. So a pathogen is anything that generates disease. Um, there are a number of similar words that we're going to be dealing with in this section. Okay, so besides pathogen, which means generate disease, um, we have allergens, whoops, I don't want to say allergens, antigens, which generates an antibody response. It doesn't generate the antibodies, but we see an increase in antibodies in response to the presence of an antigen. And we met the word antigen before when we were talking about blood typing, but we'll talk about it more next week. And then I was about to say allergen, which is going to be something that generates an allergic response. Um, and then we have pyrogens, which generate uh, temperature change. Um, in the sense that pyro, like in pyromaniac, means uh, fire or heat. Um, and uh, carcinogens, which whoops, can generate cancer. So uh, we're often hearing about things that cause cancer, generate cancer, um, carcinogens, whether it's, uh, you know, <coughs> Uh, artificial sweeteners or fumes from uh, road work outside or um, asbestos or et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of things that can that are potential. Oh, uh, another big one is um, the char on uh, steak. If you burn food, uh, there are potential carcinogens in the charred part of the meat, those kinds of things. So we'll see a number of things that have this kind of uh, construction. The gen ending means that it generates whatever the rest of the word means. Okay. Um, so 
in talking about pathogens, actually, before I go back to the presentation, um, we're going to concentrate on uh, a, a few types of pathogens that, with one exception, are organisms. Um, so pathogenic organisms, which fall into two major groups. There are prokaryotes or prokaryotic organisms and eukaryotes. Now, both of these words obviously have at their root karyo, K-A-R-Y-O, which from the Greek really translates directly to mean kernel, as in the, the center of something but it's used in biology to mean nucleus. So a prokaryote is something from uh, before the nucleus. Pro in Greek uh, doesn't mean positive like professional or uh, you know, pro versus con kind of thing, but it means before, it precedes. And so these are organisms that existed before the the um, <clears throat> development of the nucleus as a component of a cell. Whereas eukaryotes are the true nucleus organisms. Basically, we can separate all organisms into these two groups. Actually, there's three, but um, basically these two. When we say prokaryote, we usually mean bacterium. And then when we say eukaryote, we mean everything else, which would be uh, plants, animals, fungi, uh, single-celled organisms, all sorts of things that fall into those various groups. As we're talking about um, these organisms, we want to kind of consider these two classes. So I want to describe that a little bit. And that's why I have here... Um, oh. Sorry, I meant to go back to know your enemy here. Okay, so I want to tell you about these organisms that we're talking about. Now, um, okay. Um, <clears throat> bacteria are sort of our go to type of organism, uh, pathogen, and they are prokaryotes, which is to mean that they do not have nuclei or, for that matter, any membrane-bound organelles. They are just a cell membrane and sometimes a cell wall um, surrounding a cytoplasm filled with molecules, whether it's small molecules or macromolecules. Uh, everything inside of it is just this big soup. Now, it's an organized soup. The DNA doesn't just in intermingle with everything else. But there's not a nucleus that separates the DNA from everything else. Um, structurally, bacteria or prokaryotes are not very advanced. We can classify them into three basic shapes. There are rod-shaped bacteria, which, like, which is what's in this picture here. There are um, <clears throat> spherical bacteria, and there are spiral-shaped bacteria. Often when we see a picture in the textbook that says this is a pathogen, it's some sort of cartoon representation of a rod-shaped bacterium. That's our most common type of pathogen. And what we do to that type of pathogen is what we're going to do to most other types of um, organism pathogens, organism, pathogenic organisms. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, in this picture here, down at the bottom, there's a scale bar, which is one micrometer. Okay, so this... Oh my. This line down here, which is going to keep disappearing when I move the mouse down to the bottom, is labeled one micrometer. And you can kind of imagine that um, six to eight of them will go across the, the picture from side to side. And say this rod-shaped bacterium right here is about two micrometers long and maybe a quarter of a micrometer across. Okay? They're very, very small organisms. Now, I point out the width of the entire frame because what's the average size of a red blood cell? Hmm? This is something you should know when I say specifically. They're about eight micrometers in diameter. 
they're one of the smaller cells in your body. And a single red blood cell would probably cover this entire frame. Just to give you a sense of the scale here. Um, <clears throat> now, like I said, basically when we're, when we're talking about pathogens, we're going to go to this one primarily as the example. But there are other uh, pathogens that we want to talk about because of how they're different from bacteria. Now, bacteria are very simple structurally, but they're very complex um, functionally or chemically. Um, since they're really just a bag of chemicals, their function is their chemistry, their metabolism. They're highly adapted to where they survive. Bacteria can be found in all sorts of environments that we would never imagine we could, uh, organisms could be found. Um, one of the big discoveries that really shook uh, the field of biology was discovering that there are bacteria that live at the bottom of the ocean. They're nowhere near sunlight. Uh, there's probably no real oxygen to be had in the area, but they survive because they're able to convert energy from heat escaping through the crust, which is the floor of this uh, ocean, into the sea around them. And they actually survive at very high temperatures, about 70 some odd degrees Celsius, which would be, I want to say about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. No, that can't be right. Really hot, whatever it is. But um, no, more like 180 degrees Fahrenheit, I think. Anyways, um, so it really rocked biology wor worlds to think that things could exist in that location. And because of those bacteria generating energy from that heat that's escaping and causing, or not causing, but generating uh, nutrient molecules for them to exist, other organisms are able to exist down there also. So there's an entire ecosystem living at the bottom of the ocean because of these extreme bacteria that live at that depth and use that heat as an energy source. Um, <clears throat> I don't know exactly the history of when things were discovered, but maybe prior to or after to discovery of that type of bacteria, we started discovering bacteria in lots of different places. There are bacteria that live underneath the ice in Antarctica and probably uh, in the Arctic Circle too. Um, there's actually this big drilling operation up in Russia somewhere where they're drilling down through the ice somewhere up there to, to sample um, various things, including bacteria that live in there. Um, <clears throat> there's bacteria that live in the ground. And when I say in the ground, I, just, I don't mean like in the soil. You can reach in there and grab a clump of dirt and there's bacteria. There is. But what I'm talking about is up to six kilometers deep in the ground where bacteria live. Again, nowhere near sunlight, not really any oxygen in the area. They get their energy largely from radioactive material in the surrounding uh, Earth's crust. Um, <clears throat> there's been bacteria discovered in space. Now by that I don't mean alien bacteria. Uh, what it would be is some sort of meteor impact on the Earth's surface a long time ago that created a crater uh, would have thrown rocks up into the air and they would have escaped our uh, atmosphere and would be orbiting around the planet. And there are bacteria there, which are not actively living, but when they came back down to Earth and scientists investigated them, they were able to reconstitute them uh, and get them back into a functioning, living situation. Okay. Um, there's a not terribly uh, popular theory these days that possibly bacteria from Mars got to Earth and uh, <coughs> is the um, uh, source of all living things on Earth. When that theory was kind of at its heyday, there was this rock from Mars, a meteor that was a rock from Mars that landed on Earth, and so microscopists thought they found fossilized bacteria in the rock. That's since been disproved. All it was was really weird looking cracks in the rock that they thought was bacteria. It, it wasn't. Um, so the theory doesn't have a whole lot of um, uh, steam outside of, you know, History Channel. Is that where the guy goes and talks about ancient aliens and all that stuff? Yeah. So other than that, most people don't really credit that. But there is evidence of bacteria that have been in space. And when they come back down to the earth, they can survive. 
So bacteria are just in all sorts of different um, environments. We only care about the ones that are adapted to our environment. They want uh, an oxygen-rich environment, not oxygen-rich, but an oxidative environment, um, a pH of about 7.35, a temperature of about 37 degrees Celsius, um, and uh, in a um, water solution environment. Any organisms that are not adapted to that, we don't care about, because they're not going to have anything to do with our, our bodies. Um, <clears throat> any environment that they're adapted to, we aren't and we'd be dead in. So we don't have to worry about all those bacteria, just the ones that are specifically adapted to our environment. And there are plenty of them to deal with. Now, another <coughs> pathogen I want to mention is the one thing that's not an organism, um, and that's viruses. Now, when we talk about organisms, whether they're prokaryotes or eukaryotes, there are certain criteria that define them as being living organisms. One of them, which uh, viruses do not uh, satisfy, is the ability to reproduce. So an organism has to be able to reproduce to be called living. Viruses can't do that on their own. Viruses have to infect and exploit a host cell and use the host cell's ability to um, make new virus particles. And because that's how they reproduce, that's what a viral infection is all about. The genetic material in a virus is injected into one of the cells in your body, and the genes from that is used to make more viruses. Uh, I want to mention those because we do need to talk about some specifics about viruses because they're not like other pathogens and how we deal with those. Now, there's not a scale bar on this picture, but I do want to mention uh, something about a sense of scale here. These virus particles here are about 80 nanometers in diameter. 80 nanometers is <clears throat> 0.08 micrometers. Okay? So back to this picture here, okay, this scale bar down here is one micrometer. So 0 0.08 of that, 8 one hundredths of that bar is 80 nanometers. And I hope I'm doing the math in my head right there. Um, so <clears throat> this picture here would probably fit completely in the width of one of those bacteria. Maybe even, uh, I'm way off on the scale there even. But uh, so as far as a sense of scale is concerned, the previous picture of the bacteria would all fit within a single red blood cell. And what's here, these would all easily fit within a bacteria. I have no idea what viruses these are. Uh, they might be viruses that attack uh that infect humans, they might be viruses that in fact infect bacteria, they might be viruses that infect a plant, I have no idea. It's just a picture of viruses we found online. Okay. Uh, but I do want to point this out because we're going to consider some specifics about how we deal with um, viral pathogens, because it's a little bit different how we deal with other things. Now, I'm not going to talk about fungi very much right here, one, because we don't really deal with them too much. Uh, they are eukaryotic organisms as opposed to pro prokaryotes. But a lot of the things we're going to learn that have to do with fighting off bacterial infections are going to translate directly into how we deal with fungal infections. Um, we just won't really talk about them specifically. Um, and then I have this fourth category down here of parasites, which is actually a sort of catch-all for everything else. Um, parasites can be single-celled organisms or they can be multicellular organisms. But generally, they are uh, eukaryotes. Okay? Bacteria are parasitic to some extent. Um, but um, since they're prokaryotes, we're dealing with them a little bit differently. The parasites here, we can a um, single celled parasitic organism. I have protist here, which is actually kind of an old fashioned name, but uh, that'd be a single celled organism. The picture I have of this for this is an amoeba. And I just want to point this out because uh, when we talk about how white blood cells move through our body, they move in much the same fashion as an amoeba does. Just this afternoon, one of my colleagues shared with me this amazing video of white blood cells, which um, I'm going to use next week to show you how white blood cells move uh, in the body. And remember this picture because it's going to remind you of this picture quite a bit. What happens is 
the cell reaches out, the cell membrane extends out, and when it finds something in its environment that it wants to move towards, the rest of the cell follows behind. And the video that I found today uh, <clears throat> is much better than this picture kind of suggests. But I do want to point out that you can see the nucleus of this cell right here very well, as well as the texture within the cell, the cytoplasm, is hinting at other organelles, not that we can identify them, but um, there are things that might be peroxisomes or mitochondria or whatever in there too. Um, but the, the nucleus is very easy to see right here. Um, <clears throat> for the other types of parasites, which are uh, multicellular, this is a worm. Um, it's some sort of round worm. I don't know exactly which type, but I didn't really bother investigating too much. Um, but I like this picture quite a bit for two reasons. One, you can see the tissues in this animal very clearly. Okay. Now, a multicellular organism is going to be a plant or an animal or a fungus, like a mushroom. Okay. But parasitic multicellular organisms are going to be animals. There aren't parasitic plants. Um, and uh, there are parasitic fungi, but usually they're single cell fungi um, when they're going to cause an infection. This is a beautiful picture showing you the different tissues of this animal. Okay. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the edge of the animal here is its uh, epidermis, its skin. Okay, so that's epithelial tissue surrounding the outside. And then, especially right here, we can see very clearly, this is the muscular wall of the digestive tract. So this is smooth muscle tissue here. And I think this little dark spot right here may be the one at the uh, tip of the um, worm, and maybe that little one right there. I think those are part of its nervous system, but one, because it's out of focus, and two, because I'm not an expert in, in parasitic worms. Not positive, but I think that's what those are. The other reason why this is a great picture is because the day when I was putting this presentation together, um, it was in the summer. And in the summer, I teach class from 8 in the morning till noon. And so after class, I sat down in my um, <coughs> uh, office to put this together. And of course, since it was noon, I was eating lunch. It's really hard to do a Google image search for parasitic worm and not throw up. So uh, I love this picture because it's not disgusting. But in the vein of what is disgusting, let me share this guy with you. This is also a parasitic worm. This is a hookworm. Um, these are its teeth, which is you know specialized kind of bone-like tissue. Uh, and then it has um, a skin. And then we're looking down into its oral cavity, which is going to extend through uh, its digestive tract, of course. Um, there's a link down here, which I'm not going to click, click on from this point, because I actually have provided that link to you on Blackboard. So there's this link right here, right after the lymphatics learning pod, which you should have already done, uh, that says hookworm podcast. And the link, whoops, it's gone. Um, there we go. The link at the bottom of this picture here is this link right here. So I'm just going to click from here um, because you might want to follow that link yourself. It'll take you to this page. Now, Radiolab is uh, a radio show from WNYC, which is a public radio station in New York City, obviously. Um, I'm familiar with it because it's syndicated through the NPR networks. Um, and so I started listening to it because uh, when I was living down in North Carolina, it was on uh, NPR down there. And then when I was working in Boston, uh, the Boston NPR station uh, played it also. I don't actually know if it's on NPR locally. WAMC. Well, the reason I don't know is because I don't listen to it on NPR anymore. I listen to it uh, through their podcast. Um, and if you're interested in science, it's a great podcast to listen to, however you want to do it. And you don't have to be sure you're up at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning or whatever to listen to it. Um, it's great. Now, this podcast that I'm going to show you is actually a segment out of a larger episode. So if you wanted to, you'd go back here to the entire episode's page which is about parasites. And it's an hour long show, but it's really interesting. It has three or four different stories about different interesting parasites. But the one that I'm uh, going directly to here is about hookworms, and it's the one that's most directly about um, the human situation. Okay. 
Now, this is, uh, oh, it doesn't say here, but it's about 23 minutes long. Okay, We have a little less than 23 minutes left in the show, in the show, in this class. Um, but I want to play this out. I would appreciate it if you could stick around past 8.30 a little bit to hear the end of this. Uh, but if you can't, so be it. You have a link to this, and you can listen to the rest of it on your own if you need to. Uh, I want to say a couple of things before I get started. First off, you're going to hear two voices on this, um, which are Jad Abumrad, who is a sound engineer, and Robert Krolwich, who is the uh, science correspondent for NPR in general. Uh, but this is sort of his main gig. Um, <clears throat> the first guy is wonderful because being a sound engineer, he can really make you appreciate what the story is about. And you're going to viscerally experience that listening to this tonight. And that's why I really want to play this for you, um, so I can see you enjoy this so much. Um, the recording is about two stories. The first one's about uh, John, Rocke John D. Rockefeller and uh, his expansion into the South after uh, Reconstruction. And then the second one's about this guy, Jasper, who has a different take on the importance of uh, hookworms. Um, <clears throat> so let me play this for you. And while it's playing, I'm going to, uh, on the um, blank page here, write a few notes. Um, normally, if I had time, I'd talk about the podcast after it finished up. But instead, um, I'll just write this stuff up here. And then next week, uh, we'll come back to this. And uh, I'll talk about the podcast a little bit more there. Okay. So let me get this baby started. Um, Come on. Hello, I'm okay. Chad Abumrad. Hello. Hello. Robert Krovich is Radio Lab. Our topic today, parasite. Parasite. So we met them, they're nice, and we met them, they're not so nice. I don't know if we've met any nice ones, really. But we haven't, I thought, I thought this was oh, the first one. Oh, yeah. They were pretty really nice. nice. Yeah, they were nice. So, but now the question is, let's just talk about scale. I mean, for the most part, they're irritating and rural, and they seem kind of invisible, invisible, and sort of off stage. Yeah. But when you back off of them, Consider them, you know, in the effects that they have on the world. They are actually these powerful sculptors of monumental nests. In other words, these are little guys telling very great stories. In fact, here's an example. Recently, I went to visit a guy named Dixon Desvamier, of Columbia University. He's a parasitologist, and, well, he has much to do things. We ended up talking about, um, well, he told me this crazy story. The story I love telling the most. That was good. Before we start, I just want to say one thing. The following two stories contain moments that are a little bit gross. Just want to make sure you've been warned. <laughs> the story I love telling the most is how we eradicated a hookworm. The story begins in 1908. John D. Rockefeller Sr., the image guy, is sitting in his New York office. He's thinking, oh, can I make one more day? Selling something to himself. Yeah, I've got all this money, I've got all these resources. I just need a new market. In terms of new markets, the South was pretty much untapped. Who those damn Southerners? You just get off your butts and get going. Problem was, they weren't. They weren't getting off their butts. The phones were not operational. The economic engine was turned off. The economy was in the toilet. And so John D. Rockefeller wanted to know why. Why yeah. aren't they producing more? Yeah. What's happened to their economic engine? So he thought. I know, I'll form a commission. Yeah. So he sent out a bunch of economists and sociologists and people like that on the original Rockefeller Commission. They did everything a commission could possibly do to try to find out why these Southern gentlemen were not rising to the occasion. And they came back with the following conclusion. Well, we, we don't exactly know what's wrong, but we think that these people are sick from something because they don't, they don't behave like they do. What does that mean? They are slow. <laughs> Not mentally, they're slow physically, they're pale. I'll give you an example. Remember the movie Deliverance? Okay, remember that little guy that played the banjo? I remember the other scene that we all read. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to talk about that. No, we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not. No, we're not. <laughs> we call that little banjo player. Come on, have a game. Little wiry looking guy, but he looked old. Sickly pale. Yeah, sickly pale and yet an adult. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That is not a description of all Southerners. No, it's a description of one teeny corner in this. Now, what the mission did say about a lot of these Southern people that they encountered is that a lot of them, they just don't look right. 
they look weak, they look wan, they look kind of blah, wan, 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 Sounds like a medical problem. Maybe they're not lazy after all. Maybe they're anemic. Maybe they're just. Next thing you know, Rockefeller puts together another commission, this one with doctors, and he sends them back down to the south to find out what the basis for the anemia was. And not only did they find anemia, but they found a correlation of the anemia with soil types. Sandy loamy soils, anemia. Hard packed clay soils, nothing. Sandy loamy soils, fruit farmland. Hard pack clay soils, not such good farmland. So all the rich farmers were anemic and all the poor farmers were doing like that. And this seems to be a clue. The incidence of anemia was linked somehow to the soil. Maybe yeah. something was in the soil. That's correct. So somehow they hit upon this idea of looking for So they asked these southerners, would you guys defecate? Where do you do it? Most of them said something like this. I defecate over there. See that tree over there? That's where I defecate. So I defecate over there, but I live over here. Okay, so then the investigator asked the next question. When you go to that tree and do it, do you you wear any shoes? Most of them said, no. Barefoot, just like everybody else. Because it's comfortable. (laughs) So clearly these worms are in the feces that are landing near the tree. They're somehow getting into people's feet the next time they come to use the tree. But no one intentionally steps in their own, you know, no one does that. Which meant... Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, you can crawl. Right, so let's find out how far it can crawl. So they did, these researchers, they built a sandbox. And then they took some hookworm infested stool and put it right in the middle. Then every day, we will sample from the stool sample out in the sand in all directions and find larvae and find out how far they can come from that sound. So now we have larvae in the stool and they begin to crawl away from the stool seeking a victim. On day one, they crawled an entire foot in all directions, but they weren't at two feet. On day two, my God, they're at two feet. At day three, they're at three feet. I can't believe this. They're crawling a long way. Day four, they crawled to four feet. How about day five? No, I, I'm allowed to ask. Okay. That. <laughs> and what about day five? Five feet? No. No. Four feet. That's it. So after four feet, they're what? Exhausted? One would still. On day six, they were still at four feet. And on day seven, they were dead. Hey! <laughs> So how in the world could you deal with this problem when these worms can crawl, oh, they can crawl four feet, it doesn't matter where you defecate, they're going to crawl away from that. And within a four foot radius of that stool sample, you're going to get hot worm. Unless you do something radical that's never been done before. They devised a scheme for burying the stool sample into the ground six feet deep. Because if the worms can only make it four feet, well then that's two feet past the point where they die. We call that the outhouse. (laughs) So the outhouse was invented by exploring the life cycle of hookworm. And in fact, Rockefeller got his wish. The South did rise again. That sounds too easy to me, though. Yeah, you're telling me that, that uh, an understanding of what temperature is the outhouse removed the, quote, southern laziness that these things they did rise? And you, you bring that all back to the hookworm? Really? No, I, I believe you bring it back to sanitation. Now, to be fair, you can find 
on plenty of other reasons why the South is scant. Air conditioning, you know, highways, the university, right. and stuff like that. And Oakland has some help. But what is clear is that when we as a country began to distance ourselves from our own excrement, to put it bluntly, when we stopped walking around in our own <laughs> there are all of these unintended consequences. Salmonella disappeared, yes, Lillian disappeared, Shigella disappeared, cholera disappeared, Giardia disappeared, cryptosporia, anything that's associated with parasites and feces disappeared. Every time we go out at them, and people use them religiously, guess what? Their kids can stay in school longer. They can learn more. They got a head faster. Dixon Desmondia is a professor of public health and environmental health sciences and microbiology at Columbia University. Can they make longer titles of that university? <laughs> he literally wrote the book on parasites. The book is called Parasitic Diseases. You know it very well. It's soon to be a major motion picture. <laughs> now it's fourth edition. It is fourth edition. And while we're on the subject of bookworms and the glorious campaign to deworm America, because this has been a very carefully crafted and intentionally fair program, mm -hmm. and you have heard the case against bookworms, now let's turn the coin. And say something nice about the world. And to begin that discussion, let's go to our reporter Patrick Walters. So, Pat, are you th are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Robert. So, tell us a little bit about this fellow. What's his name exactly? His name is Jasper Lawrence. I'm sorry, Jasper Lawrence. So, where is he from? He actually grew up in England. He grew up in this little farm in the southwest corner of England. It's important to know, I think, before hearing any part of the story, that Jasper has had allergies for pretty much his whole life. On really bad days, my eyes would swell up so much from pollen or airborne allergens that they would feel like they were swelling shut. I could feel my eyes squeaking in my sockets. It was an enormously uncomfortable feeling. But it was nothing debilitating. They were just allergies. So, you know, he's just like, like most other people have allergies, just learn to deal with it. You know, you live with it. Right. What changed for me in my late 20s, early 30s was my asthma. At that time, I was living in Santa Cruz. I was relatively recently married. We had three cats. Uh, we've been grandfathered in with the relationship. And I started a landscaping business. I really didn't want to work for someone else. I think someone with allergies starting a landscaping business, that seems kind of unexpected. I mean, stupid is actually the word. For it. <laughs> and uh, within six months or a year, he starts to notice this really weird barking cough. Was there anything particular that brought this on? Like, no, it was, it was just sitting and breathing. Okay. Um, cat certainly didn't help. Right. And uh, during that period, my asthma got much worse very, very quickly. By the time it was 1996, 1997, I was seeing specialists having skin allergen tests and cycling through emergency inhalers, trying Singular and all these other drugs that were coming on the market. I was being hospitalized. Um, at least a couple of times a year. I mean, I, I looked terrible. I had dark eyes and pale, waxy skin. I had that allergic look. It was a really bad time. And he decides in the summer of 2004 to take a vacation. He made this visit to, to England. Yeah. I took my two daughters back to see my aunt who had raised me. Very early in the visit, I was sitting at her kitchen table, and she asked me if I'd seen a BBC documentary about parasites in there connection with things like asthma and allergies, multiple sclerosis. And of course I hadn't. But I went upstairs and go on the internet after lunch. And I stayed on the internet until perhaps two in the morning. And he's still on. He's reading and reading and work all these research. One study after the next on Japan, after you watch the studies and after the how he walks multiple sclerosis, this enormous weight. Of evidence that in the developing world, people don't really have asthma or allergies. And what he discovers is that behind all of this, to his shock, is hookworms. Hookworm? Yeah, hookworm. Yeah, I learned that a asthma was 50% less likely than someone who had a hookworm infection. So this was 
So uh, there's a bit more to this, and I this is actually where I stopped with my day class today. Um, so we'll pick up with the recording at this point, and you'll hear the rest of it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> uh, we'll finish out what this is about, and then we'll get into the immune response stuff. Um, so we'll call that a night right there and um, pick up next time. <laughs>